Thanks to be here. Today's an extra seminar uh, of John. So as uh, Nadia said, John probably needs no introduction since <laughs> everyone knows him, but uh, let me introduce him. So after his master in, uh, in Amsterdam, John started a PhD at the Vessel in, to in 2018 on a EU biodiversity project, BioVeins, called BioVeins of course, on urban ecology. It was not an easy project, I tell you, but he managed to survive and actually did quite well. So, But the fact is that after four years, none of his chapters was dealing with the topic of the project I submitted. So this tell a lot about uh, the creativity of John in uh, not just, uh, you know, go behind the, the low hanging fruits. So, and uh, we will hear some of these topics, extra topics in this presentation. So after the PhD, John did uh, two years uh, postdoc between Basel and Erwag, during which continued publishing uh, data from the different projects and made an important contribution to, the, to my current Synergia project by leading the plant survey in 180 <laughs> green spaces in Lugano, Geneva and Zurich. So today, Joan will leave Basel, unfortunately, <laughs> after six years with an important legacy of 16 um, paper in peer-reviewed journals, half of which as a first author. So I think it's a, an, a great achievement and several others are submitted or in review. In January, Joan, in, uh, Joan uh, will move to the Technical University of Munch on a mobility fellowship and they will work together with uh, Monica Egerer, which is, uh, uh, who is a, a well-known urban ecologist. And during this time, he will remain as a guest, um, scientific guest at the VSL. So thanks, Joanne, for offering us this uh, seminar uh, titled Some Insight from Bi uh, on Biodiversity in Anthropocene. And by the way, at the 4, 4 p.m., there will be a small apero in the canteen, <laughs> and if you haven't signed the card and put some money in the box, there is still uh, until three uh, such a things in the, in the entrance. Thank you. And thanks, Marco, enjoy. for the introduction. And yeah, thanks for coming. I know that the weather was not the best. So the time has come for my goodbye seminar. And as Marco said, I'm gonna present a bit some insights on biodiversity in the Anthropocene. You see the title has changed a bit, but basically on, or in other words, I'm gonna talk of what have I done at the VSL all this time. So this seminar is about myself. So I would like to also give you a bit of background of me for those who doesn't know me or don't know all the details. So I was born in Barcelona. And already at the early age, I had my first contact with Switzerland, which maybe explains my choices afterwards. So you can see here, I was quite well integrated <laughs> in the Swiss landscape. And I look quite surprised <laughs> by what I'm seeing. So back in Barcelona, I did my bachelor in biology in the University of Barcelona. And afterwards, on my said, I moved to Amsterdam in the Netherlands to do my master's in ecology and evolution at the Free University of Amsterdam and the University of Amsterdam. And then in 2017, I moved to Switzerland in Zurich to do my PhD in urban ecology, both at the VSL and the ATH with Marco and Loic Pellissier. So I got like the full Swiss cultural <laughs> experience. <laughs> then I stayed here for these uh, couple of postdocs and you can see like, some of the field work from this year. And now, as Marco said, I'm moving to, to Munich to start my postdoc mobility and the Humboldt Fellowship, maybe, uh, with Monica Egerer at the Technical University of Munich. So having said that, I would like to talk to you a bit of my research interest. And I would like to start with this uh, picture, which I saw recently in an exhibition in Zurich from the photographer Sebastião Salgado, which shows us a landscape in the Amazon, and it's titled a bit like the paradise exists. And it reminds us that in the earth, we have like these very wild areas still, it's like paradise kind of. But at the same time, we know that our landscapes and, and the world are changing very fast due to the action of humans. And this basically pose the idea of conservation, not only as a science itself, but within the era of the Anthropocene. And with that, we know that there is a lot of panels, agreements, meetings, conventions to discuss about how do we deal with all the impacts on biodiversity and humans and so, and all these different challenges. And I think there are four points that for me are important from these different conventions and so, and that 
I'm more personally interested. This is understanding the ecological and social mechanisms shaping by the biodiversity patterns and eco-evolutionary processes across the scales. Then there is also the need to integrate highly anthropogenic ecosystems, basically cities in my case, in biodiversity con conservation schemes, developing tools to tackle both ecological and social cha changes and challenges, and finally quantify progress in protection measures. So throughout these different years at the VSL, I different with through different projects I've been trying to or I've been working actually in, in, in these different points in two main disciplines, urban ecology and conservation biology, but not only as them as a separate, but also between the intersection between the two of them. So you will start talking about the first three points. If I'm good in time, maybe we'll talk about the last fourth point. So the first one is about urban ecology and conservation as an intersection. But if we talk about conserving or preserving biodiversity in cities, it may not be super straightforward or might be something a bit weird because we know that biodiversity declines are in part due to urbanization effects. And if we think about the first cities, we go back in history, uh, they were probably not much related at all with conservation, like the first walls not only were to keep humans out, but probably to keep the wilderness out of cities. And this is how it was during ancient times. And actually we know that urbanization and the appearance of cities all over the world had main profound negative impacts in the surrounding environment and ecosystems. We have evidences in Europe or in the Mediterranean, in Africa, in America and so on. More recently, and maybe in a more visual way here, you have like the, current image of New York, but if we go back to how it used to be when the settlers arrived, we can see like basically main disruptions on the landscape. But this is also visible in regions of the world that have a longer urban history. Here you have the metropolitan area of Barcelona in the 1947. So you can see it's basically a matrix of small towns and agricultural areas. In a period of bah, less than 80 years, it has changed quite a lot. So obviously, urbanization involves habitat loss, disturbances, stress, invasions, exclusion, etc., and all together at the end reduces biodiversity and leads to what we know as biotic homogenization. Few taxa appearing in most of the cities, and it's because of this that historically cities have been, have been considered as a, as ecological deserts, as uh, Charles Elton said. But at the same time, the narrative regarding urban ecosystems, biodiversity and conservation has evolved a lot. And not only in science, but look at these different um, stakeholder interdisciplinary products. You can see that the focus on urban nature and potential for conservation is quite uh, brought upwards. So how did this happen and why did this happen? I think to answer these questions, we need to review a bit how the conservation frameworks have evolved since conservation biology was formally started as a discipline and how this has influenced like the establishment and evolution of urban ecology and the intersection with conservation biology. And I will use this paper from Georgina Mays, which I think it's very good in summarizing this evolution of thought. So the first conservation framework that we have from the 1960s and that still exists nowadays is this one called Nature for Itself, which is based in wilderness, pristine areas, protected areas, and is by definition, in my opinion, anti-urban because urban areas are not pristine or wild at all. Around that time that these conservation frameworks appeared, urban ecology is, was established as a formal discipline. People have done urban, urban ecology before, especially in the Second World War, but it's in the 70s when it's established as a proper discipline. With the establishment of two actual uh, schools of thought, the Berlin and the Baltimore schools of urban ecology, with different focus and that provided a lot of information, especially on the ecology in cities. So trying to do ecology inside urban environments in these habitats that still look like more natural or remnants of natural areas or, or semi-natural. At that point, those cities are not, see, not seen yet as an ecosystem. So the nature for itself conservation framework was soon proved to be insufficient or challenged by the increasing documentation on the effects of human activities in the environment. We have, for instance, the Chernobyl accident, the ozone depletion phenomenon, and et cetera, that proved that humans were affecting a lot the environment. With this, we have a second framework called Nature Despite People, which basically put the focus on trying to protect nature even though humans were around, mitigating the anthropogenic activities, understanding them, 
quantifying them, find trade-offs, et cetera. But soon this framework also become limited or um, not enough because the impact of human activities gain a much larger spatial and temporal in, um, scope. First with the definition of the Anthropocene era that show that human activities through niche construction have been affecting the walls, landscapes and climate since millennia. And also by discovering that products of human activities were found even in wild, very wild areas like the Antarctica. With this, we have a second framework, which is called Nature for People, the one that many of us are very used to work with sometimes, with ecosystem services, the ecosystems approach, and the monetization and valuation of nature for people. And this framework is quite used still nowadays, but it has been criticized by this idea of utilitarianism and the monetization of biodiversity, which is not always a positive thing. Around that time in the 1990s, we start seeing the first links between urban ecology and conservation. And here I'm gonna present some of the papers of the journals from the Society of Conservation Biology, just to show you how this uh, link between conservation biology has been evolving in less than 20 years. So in 2006, we have the first uh, papers that basically, we didn't think it's been corrupted to date, okay. So the first one is called conservation where people live and work, but the second one is actually called the pigeon paradox, uh, the need to preserve urban biodiversity for conservation, just that the PDF, it has moved a lot. So these two papers basically suggest adding or moving conservation to cities for three reasons. First, because current conservation is insufficient or was insufficient at that time, because they recognize that connection and exposure to nature and wilderness increase uh, awareness and willingness for conservation elsewhere. And then these human nature interactions were increasingly more located in cities. At the same time, because they call it like this pigeon paradox, it, urban biodiversity was not um, valued at all. They were thought to be composed of basically pigeons, very dominant species with lack of rarity, with a strong influence of invasion and competition. So this leads us to leads me to the last uh, conservation framework, which is the people and nature. And this one is completely a change. Conservation biology is not anymore within the ecological disciplines, but it gets integrated within social disciplines, political, geographical concepts like environmental justice, colonialism, uh, injustices, equity are starting to gain a more bigger impact to also uh, be included in, in conservation. And we have something very interesting or very important which is the definition of socio-ecological system or, or socio-ecological ecosystems, basically. And this has a lot to do with the mention of novel ecosystems by Richard Hobbs and collaborators, which basically recognize that many of their uh, ecosystems were kind of shaped by humans in a way in another, and that they have a role for conservation and for restoration. This generated a lot of debate at that time. I'm not gonna enter, but for urban ecology, this was very important. But this framework that looks a bit like, at that time, look a bit like very challenging and novel, is something that humans have known since a long time. Sometimes you just need to travel back 2,500 years to, to see that this idea of a socio-ecological system was already in the thoughts of, of ancient uh, historians or philosophers that even didn't know a lot about um, ecology. So in this quote from Cicero, he starts talking about the fact that humans dominate nature and says like total dominion over the produce of the earth lies in our hands. Then he brings some examples of how humans are shaping the land, but it concludes with something that for me is quite important saying, and in short, by the work of our hands, we strive to create a sort of second nature within the world of nature. And this for me is the first mention to what we could say novel ecosystems or socio-ecological ecosystems. So with that, um, urban ecology also evolved, uh, continued to evolve. And already in the 2011 or during this decade, we see that conservation in urban areas has acquired different dimensions. Cities are recognized as an ecosystem now at this point with the increasing data that show all the biodiversity that happens in cities and how it's assembled. And we're starting to have reports about data that allows to compare urban ecosystems with natural areas, with agricultural areas, and that starts to giving value as a city for itself. You see the number of papers documenting urban biodiversity has increased a lot. And I just learned yesterday 
that apparently Marco was one of the 10 most productive authors within this period. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> um, so some examples in, in Zurich, for instance, regarding plant biodiversity in two sampling campaigns, one in Europe in five cities, and the other one in Switzerland in three cities, we sample over 2,000 and 1,700 plant species, which is actually a lot. Or regarding the animals, this is all the data that has been compiled by Marco and his minions, including myself. So you can see like a lot of uh, invertebrate or mostly invertebrate species. And these are species one would expect if there was a lot of competition and invasion, that they were basically hyper, hyper dominant with not that much rarity. But if we study the diversity distribution here in the x-axis, you have the uh, species identity. And on the y-axis, you have the abundance. We see that few species are super abundant and super widespread. They are very common. But the vast majority of species actually have low abundances and they are locally distributed, they are rare. And this distribution of biodiversity basically resembles one of the few universal laws in ecology, which is like this uh, yeah, rarity diagram. In addition, we know, and this paper showed it like very recently, that we have a species of conservation concerns that can or only persist in cities through human activities and cons active conservation and restoration of, of habitats. And yeah, the intersection between urban ecology and conservation is still evolving. And now we see like this interdisciplinarity with the addition of social equity, anti-colonialism, racism, environmental justice, social justices, and so on. With the development of a last um, branch of thought, which is ecology for cities, and it has like this interdisciplinary definition. And the reason of adding this Discipline, interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity, I don't know what is the right word, is because cities yeah, are not homogeneous at all. So if we think like an urban ecosystem, like the city of Zurich that you have in this map here, is not an homogeneous landscape of different variables. We can see that environmental variables, like abiotic, like temperature, tree cover, pollution, pet density, etc they form gradients, but it's not only about the environment. We know that these are also reflecting social gradients, income, um, unemployment, criminality, education, um, ethnic composition. This is all structured along the cities. And this is a structure because and overarching anthropogenic processes and factors that basically explain, for instance, residential segregation, gentrification, um, active law, law enforcement policies and so, and that reflect a lot um, systemic biases often. And these have, of course, consequences on biodiversity, on um, ecological and evolutionary processes and biodiversity patterns, but also on nature contributions to people and at the end on people itself. And if you don't believe me yet, just take these images. These are two adjacent neighborhoods in the city of Johannesburg. So probably if you were to decide whether there are differences or not between tree cover, pollution, access to water, biodiversity or diversity of birds, but also on criminality, on income, on security, you would probably um, yeah, determine that there are some changes here. But it's not always in such, um, not has to be like that strong, but we also see these differences in other cities. For instance, here, if we compare the, the richest and the poorest um, districts in Barcelona, we also see main differences in all these factors. So to, or going back a bit with my research, to work on this link between urban ecology and conservation biology, um, I mean, there is a lot of work that has been done of that, but still there is a lot of gaps and consideration. And you can see here a summary of some of the perspectives, opinion papers that have been published uh, recently. And here I will mention three main points where I try to contribute myself. There is the need to increase the spatial coverage and also to generate transferable outputs, not only for ecology, but for other disciplines. The need to increase the taxonomic coverage and then the need to improve the mechanistic understanding, which is something that happens in any discipline anyway, but especially through a focus on trade-based approaches, on studying species interactions and better characterizing socio-ecological drivers and including them in urban ecology models and studies. So all of these I try to do within different projects as well focusing on understanding the effects on eco-evolutionary uh, uh, processes and biodiversity patterns, of course. So I'm gonna present yeah, some of the results of these four projects. 
And I would like to start with the first one, which basically deals with wild bees and honeybees uh, in cities. And I don't think there is a better way to start talking about my research than with a Star Wars meme. But this meme is not only to make you laugh, but to point out the misunderstanding between honeybee and pollinator conservation. And I say that because honeybees are not the only bee species that we have. Actually, we have many more. And in Switzerland, there, are, there is more than 600 wild bee species. But still we hear, or we have heard for a long time about the honeybee crisis and the pollinator conservation. And a bit in a dramatic way, like honeybees are disappearing and we are all gonna die. This narrative actually had made honeybees like a very likable animal. And it's very surprising because it's an insect which per se wouldn't be very much likable. To the point people will do that to their pets. <laughs> but are honeybees really in danger? Question. So if we check data worldwide, we can see that since the 1960s, almost continuously, there's been an increase in the number of honeybee hives. And this has been also focused in some continents more than another, but in general, we see this increase. You can also argue that, okay, that in the 90s, there is a decline in the total number of honeybees, but this has nothing to do with Baroa or the pollinator extinction crisis. It has to do with the fall of the Soviet Union and the changes in the economical activities that followed. So not that, and as you see, it's basically focused on in Europe. The narrative on the honeybee crisis has had consequences in cities by the promotion of urban beekeeping, which has become a very popular activity in many cities in the world. And here you have some data from five cities that show that how between like the last 15 years, the number of hives and as well the density of hives have increased a lot. Just to give you a reference, usually in agricultural areas, we talk about three hives per square kilometer, which is much lower than this. In Switzerland, this is also the case. And uh, in several of the cities that we studied, we found uh, increases in the number of honeybees. Oh no, I think like the presentation is not super, okay, well, there's been some corruption here. Um, a lot of uh, increases, especially in the, in the city of Zurich. You don't see it, but you have to believe, <laughs> basically. So the rapid increase in honeybees poses a question on whether this increase is threatening some while, somehow the wild bee communities and whether the existing floral resources are sufficient to maintain uh, the wild bee communities and an increasing number of honeybee individuals. We know that honeybees and wild bees may compete and usually we believe this was through exploitative competition, the protection of resources. But recently we have the first reports on this behavior, which is like pollen robbing by honeybees and wild bees, and that we don't know exactly what is the scope in other ecosystems. So to, under, to answer this question, we need to understand how wild bees and honeybees partition the available resources and what is the role of resource availability and beekeeping intensity at different scales. If competition for feeding resources would be occurring, we would expect an increase in the niche partitioning because wild bees having functionally equivalent traits to honeybees, they would compete more for resources and be um, uh, suppressed basically or excluded. So to test all of this, we gather, like we use data that was collected in 23 gardens. And basically their honeybees and wild bees, they were captured and their traits were measured at the individual level. And also um, there was some gathering on data on the resource availability and beekeeping intensity at the landscape and local scales. With this at every side, we calculated a metric of niche partitioning, but basically was how similar were the community of wild bees to the population of honeybees. And we assess the influence of this resource availability and keeping intensity on the wild bee species richness, this niche partitioning, and as well of, uh, on the number of honeybees present at the site. So what we found is that beekeeping intensity didn't directly affect neither the wild bee species richness nor the niche partitioning. So we don't have a direct effect. What we saw is that resource availability was the main driver of both wild bees and honeybees, but operating at different spatial scales. Honeybees were mostly influenced by the resource availability at the landscape scale. So where the, when the landscape surrounding the study sites became depleted of green areas, honeybees tended to accumulate inside the, our focal study sites. When this happened, even though it was not significant, we saw a decrease in the number of wild bees. On the other hand, wild bees were mostly influenced by the resource availability at the local scale. When sites had more plant diversity, they had more wild bee species and therefore more niche partitioning by the addition of new phenotypes. 
So these differences in the relationship with the resource availability put some questions because we know that honeybees are not that wild bees. They are managed, so they can be provided with food. They are distributed mostly following human decisions and they are maintained. They have larger foraging ranges, they are super generalists, and they have this capacity of concentration and dilution effect according to what happens in the landscape where they live. Whereas wild bees, they are more or less constrained to the sites where they nest. And we know that the hives in Zurich, since the moment this data was collected in 2016, have increased quite a lot. So how is this affecting uh, honeybees is not super clear. Um, we also know that the, that the problematic or the potential regulation is not only ecological because urban beekeeping is a social ecological system or beekeeping in general. Um, here what we studied is, and it's very important to know how beehives are distributed according to the different beekeeping actors. And I say beekeeping actors because it's not only individuals, but could be companies, hotels, um, business, uh, the municipality, and so on. And here you have data on three cities where I, you see like on the X axis is the different beekeeping actors and on the Y axis, you have the number of beehives. And as you can see, the majority of beekeepers have very few hives. They have between one to six. And a small fraction of them have a large number of hives. We see like a, an imbalance or an asymmetry in the distribution of hives. For instance, the Hotel Marriott in Zurich has 22 hives in the rooftop, to give you an example. This poses like main, um, problems that were a bit like summarized in this article in the, New the Washington Post because the demand and use of these floral resources, which are a common good, is completely asymmetrical between these players. Some of them are actually consuming much more than the others. Few of them are consuming much more than the vast majority of the others. This was a bit summarized by the comment of this user called Salat und Pizza, saying like any society fighting for a finite supply of resources, an overwhelming number of one group will dominate and overpower lesser groups. So this is a bit like the conclusion that we are dealing now uh, with urban beekeeping, not only in these cities, but also increasingly reported in other cities worldwide. So we go to the second project. It's hopefully more or less on the time, but we will see. Uh, so this one is, it deals a bit on the distribution of biodiversity or producing outputs to study the diversity at the city level and to transfer that to other disciplines. And this is one of the main problems. How do we solve ecological, urban planning and society problems um, with new outputs? And this is a, yeah, a recurrent topic in, I would say, in, within urban ecology. But it seems that spatial biodiversity models, which are predictive models that include, for instance, species distribution models, the species richness models, and basically at the end produce maps, could be a tool to not only solve ecological problems, but also transfer it to other disciplines. As you see, like mapping, as they say in this yeah, quote, is something that it's very human and it's yeah, quite useful in general. But the question is, can we apply spatial biodiversity models in cities? Is it even possible? So we need both predictors and responses. And we know that the availability of predictors at the right resolutions is increasing worldwide. Regarding the responses, we also know that the community science tool is providing a lot of data like JBIF. And even though this data is not perfect and has like several limitations, it can be put into practice for making these spatial biodiversity models, as you see for the city of Los Angeles. Other cities, especially rich ones, they have good data sets on biodiversity, like Berlin, Zurich, Paris, London, and so on and so forth. So here we use the data for Zurich that was collected during 10 years in 252 sites, which were the most common urban green spaces in the world, basically. And here we use data on 12 taxonomic groups and we collected several predictors representing, um, yeah, socio-ecological conditions. With this, we perform the species distribution models and the species richness models. So I won't go a lot with the, in detail with that, but I will show you directly the outputs that we got. So on the left side, for those not familiar, this is the city of Zurich. And on, on the right side, you can see the predicted number of species of the different taxa. As you can see, well, this is not continuous, obviously. We can see different type of information appearing, which for to start has some implications for ecology. This allows us, for instance, to see hotspots and cold spots of the city, to identify gradients. We can check the influence of different predictors and so. But this information can be combined by other spatial products and can be transferred to other um, 
areas. For instance, it can be put in context with green, um, greening plants, densification plants, climate adaptation plants as well. It can be checked with other social, cultural, and economic variables to highlight eco, um, environmental justice or social justice. It can help us developing metrics on nature contribution to people and address life quality issues. So a simple approach that we did in this first paper was to check the management implica implications. So we basically overlap the predicted values with different habitat categories that basically were defined based on the management. And what we saw is that green areas with low management, like they were not cut that much, meadows, basically, they were having much larger biodiversity than loans. This is not very surprising, but if we see the distribution of these two habitats inside the city of Zurich, we see that there is a lot of potential for management relaxation and to kind of do some biodiversity friendly management with a kind of low cost rather than creating the novo green areas. So something that we explore here, in this case, we did like a subset of a model with spiders. We use data on NDVI, temperature, and rent as a proxy of the income. We obtained this predicted map of spiders. And then what we did was to check the overlap with rent. And surprisingly, what we see is that the spider diversity declines with more rent and with more income, which actually goes in like it's not what we would expect by the luxury effect. So I mean, this type of models also help us um, testing social and ecological hypotheses and theories, or can help us with that. And with this, I moved to the project Biovent, which is the one I was hired for. It took a bit, eh? <laughs> And this one, we did it in seven cities with 240 sites that were distributed in a latitudinal gradient that I very artistically plotted here. Well, plotted. And during this project, we collected a lot of data from biodiversity from different groups. And we basically assess the influence of different um, environmental factors on shaping the, the diversity and use this replicated design to test hypotheses and theories in ecology. This has led to a lot of papers from the different working groups, but I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but just like the more recent ones or like the ones that we were more involved with. So the first one working with cavity nesting bees, uh, multi like a multi-trophic system. We know that main divers of this multi-trophic diversity of these food webs are habitat amount, temperature, and biotic interactions. And in addition, within the habitat amount, in the case of cities, we have this uh, single large or small, several small debate. And the idea of whether fragmentation is or not the main driver of biodiversity decline. If the debate would be towards single large and several small, then we cannot do many things in cities because cities are characterized by having several, normally very small patches of habitat that are very heterogeneous. So how this uh, is influenced or in biodiversity, you think it's, uh, it's worth um, testing within this. So we use a subset of cities and sites. We install trap nests, which are like big hotels, but also for wasps and their natural enemies. And with this, we quantified the community structure of cavity nesting bees and wasps, like abundance and richness. And we also quantify some performance and life history traits, which are quite difficult to assess in insects. These are like the survival rate, the parasitism rate, the sex ratios, and the total number of brood cells per nest, like using this uh, bee nest that you see here. So what we found first uh, regarding the community structure of, of host, uh, host richness and abundance, we saw that along urban intensity gradients, mostly defined by changes in the amount of green, uh, of green spaces at different buffers, we saw a decline in both species ranges and abundance. So more urban intensity, less green around our study sites, less species, basically. Also, the urban intensity and the changes in, a, in the habitat amount the, um, lead a decline in the number of cells per nest, the survival rate and the proportion of females. And all of these together show us that this idea from Leonor Farik about the habitat amount hypothesis focusing on this debate between patch size and isolation and, and changing a bit the paradigm is something that is actually quite enlightening for urban ecosystems because it helps us understand why some areas in urban or some sites in urban areas can sustain biodiversity through the existence of this network of small patches that are accessible within a local landscape of, of the focal species, which is the case that we see here. 
And now we want to go to the last project within this part. And in this case, we move to the wall of bumblebees. But before I want to tell you that a main thing for conservation is to study the nutritional ecology, uh, like the dietary patterns and nutrient intake, because these are very important, not only to understand the ecology of taxa, but to understand also the, the, their conservation. And here, for instance, you can see that as floral diversity gets reduced, we not only lose plants and interactions, but we are losing nutrients. And this actually is what is filtering the presence of different species. We had like some um, studies on the diet. So in this trapness, because are very time consuming to, to use, we also uh, extracted the pollen on four bee species. And through pollen metabarcoding, we characterized the plants that they were eating. And this actually show us that these bees that were very um, distributed in cities were not only generalists, as one would might expect it, but they were also like following a continuum in feeding specialization and uh, strategies. We had, of course, a highly generalist bee that fed it on many plants and species, but we had a highly specialist bee that basically fo um, focused on three plant species. And then we had some intermediate generalist bees, Osmia cornuta and Osmia bicornis, that fed it on different species, but within some preferred families. And this actually, it's quite interesting to see because this distribution is also quite explained by human activities. So the stick specialists, of course, because their target plants are widely distributed uh, and is linked to a relaxation in mowing uh, management. The intermediate generalists are also quite distributed because the preferred plants are usually woody species from families that are also selected for humans for gardening and for urban forestry. And that might compensate uh, for resources in areas where herbaceous vegetation is not that distributed. And the last one, the generalist species, because of the road ref, um, preferences, it can shift to novel resources, for instance, exotic plants, uh, when the environmental conditions are quite hard. And this explains a bit the distribution over the city. So going back a bit with the bumblebees, we know that floral resources vary and or can vary between land uses, for instance, between urban and rural areas. But how this is affecting ecological and evolutionary processes like changes in the interactions, but also in the phenotypic phase is not super clear. So what we did here is using data that was collected in three urban and three rural regions in, in Switzerland, where 2000 bumblebees of two uh, species, Bambus pascorum and Bambus lapidarius, were sampled by Helen Egenberger. And basically, she quantified, like, she measured different functional traits, like body size, tongue lengths, and so. And discovered that urban bumblebees were smaller in general and more phenotypically uh, diverse than their rural counterparts. And this opened a question on whether what is the link with the nutrition of the bumblebees, because if they are smaller and they have smaller tongue lengths and so, who are they eating? Is it affecting at all? So to do that or to understand that, we use also again pollen metabarcoding techniques to characterize the, the dietary patterns, what plants were in the pollen of the bumblebees. But we also use chemistry analysis to also understand the nutrient intake, what is the value of amino acids and fatty acids of the plants they are eating, because this is actually what it matters more. So this is a work in progress, I cannot tell you the full picture yet, but we know that regarding morphological traits, urban bumblebees are smaller than rural ones. And we discovered that regarding dietary patterns, urban bumblebees here in this figure in the blue dots are eating or have a much broader diet. They're visiting or collecting pollen from many more plants, from many more functional groups and from many more phylogenies than their rural counterparts. We couldn't see a link between the morphological trait variability and the dietary patterns. And now we're waiting to see what is the relationship with the nutrient input so we know that they are eating more plants or they are collecting pollen from more plants, but are they eating actually better? They're getting more nutrients. We are still analyzing that, but we have three scenarios. It could be that they actually have more nutrients. And this means that the last scenario, more plant species, more nutrients, and that's why they might do better in cities. But it could be the contrary, that they are actually having worse nutrient intake, intake which means that this large number of plants is basically trying to compensate for changes in the plant assemblages and the diversity distribution of plants in urban ecosystems, which is quite different from rural areas. And it can be that it is equivalent, which means that at the end, the nutrients are the most important thing more than plant species riches and that urban areas and um, rural areas, they are equivalent in terms of providing essential nutrients. We will see in the future. I don't know who are 
in time. I don't have that much, so I will go very briefly on this. The last part is more focused on conservation biology and to assess or quantify progress in protection measures. So with this, we use data from the Info Species that has collected community level data on many animals. And now a lot of groups are working, including Loic here. <laughs> Uh, so what we did is to only focus on, on wild bees, and with these different community plots, we calculated alpha and beta functional and taxonomic metrics, and we use the species richness models to predict over Switzerland, obtaining these maps. With these, we define it a series of hotspots with where the cells having the 10% highest um, diversity values. And what you see is that basically alpha and beta diversity are distributed in different parts of Switzerland. So I didn't pull like the elevation, but basically alpha diversity metrics are more in the lowlands or a bit in the midlands, and beta diversity metrics are more located in the high elevation areas and sometimes in the, in the midlands. So there is a elevation or a spatial mismatch. With that, we wanted to see the overlap with protected areas with the network of Switzerland. And what we saw, is that there was also a mismatch with the distribution of protected areas, which was especially clear for alpha diversity metrics. So here you see the proportion of these hotspots that fell into protected areas for alpha diversity is usually less than 20%. For beta diversity is a bit higher because beta diversity or uniqueness is more concentrated in high elevation and there's where we have more protected areas. But we know that these high elevation areas are expected to suffer the most from climate change with changes in plant communities, migration of lowland species. So what will happen in the future, even though there are protected areas is a bit more um, uncertain. So with this, I think it's time that I shut up. So I will go to the conclusions. Uh, at this point, I hope, if you were not convinced already from my PhD defense, that cities are a fascinating system to study ecological and evolutionary questions that cities must uh, be included and engage in conservation strategies because urban biodiversity is kind of an asset and that the role of using all or new lenses to basically tackle different questions uh, in, in urban ecology. Here I talk mostly about biogeography, metabarcoding, or interspecific trade variability, but there are other approaches that are developed now like eDNA, remote sensing and so on that can help us sharing light, uh, produce outputs that are transferable, um, inform management and so the, in a very interesting way. And finally, that we need to quantify success in pro, uh, in, and progress in conservation strategies if we want to meet these COP15 uh, agreements on protected areas uh, or that they work for something. So we want to thank, yeah, well, funders, research institutions, authorities, and so. And of course, like my two supervisors and everybody who, had, or who has helped me in a way or another during these six years, that includes the Landscape Ecology Group, my co-authors, UN members, civil services, civil servants, bachelor and master students, VSL colleagues, all my friends, my family, and so on. And to all of you to, yeah, to be so awake still <laughs> at the end of the presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you. And yeah, maybe we have time for questions. Yeah, I think so. Thanks, John, for <laughs> this really fascinating tour de force. Um, I mean, I open the, the, the discussion if someone has questions. Otherwise, I have to. Oh, Francois has a question. Okay. I was wondering about the, your finding on the size of the bumblebees in the urban habitats. Mm -hmm. I have seen the opposite results, so bigger uh, bumblebees in the cities. That was explained by authors like as a better ability to disperse, so to visit few patches that are in different locations. And there was a paper that was published, I think, one week ago, or just like by uh, the group of Nacho Bartomeus that shows that... Um, Bumble, uh, bees with a uh, bigger brain size, so I guess bigger bees, mm -hmm. are better adapted to, to, site, to cities. So I don't know, like, how do you explain your result in the, in the context of other results? Is it... So this is the paper from Helen, and actually it's true that in the, several studies have showed the opposite, actually. 
what it was hypothesized here, maybe Marco, you know it better because I don't have all the details, but I think it was the idea that smaller bumblebees, they might disperse less, but they also have less nutritional demands. And also like there is the state of with temperature. And so, so this was like the explanation I think it was provided to, to explain like the reduction in, in body size, because you see reductions in body sizes in other taxa in urban uh, environments, which may be also due to stress or, or, or so. With accessibility of plants, like the accessibility of plants and tongue lengths, not very sure um, we have enough data. It was in Zurich, the, this result. This was in Zurich, Basel, and Bern. Mm -hmm. And there are other studies I think have been in other cities. I don't know exactly how equivalent is the methodology and so. It might be also that they were much denser cities or a different urban context because Swiss cities are not the biggest ones. But I would say, yeah, it's not yeah, yet super clear that there is a universal direction in phenotypic changes in urban areas. And yeah, so yeah. we're doing now is to see like the genetics of that, or actually Christine <laughs> is working with this and maybe we can see a bit of, of, of light on what is maybe driving these phenotypical changes or not. And I think you have also to distinguish uh, filtering effect at the community level where bumblebees are, is one of the species or uh, you know, body size um, uh, with um, high mobility that, that make two, um, is a winner in, in cities, but then in the intraspecific, then you have a, a different story, no? So within the species uh, that manage to be in, in the city, you, you see a, a different story that uh, maybe cities do not provide enough uh, nutrients or, or resources, and for this reason, uh, they are smaller or it's too hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question related to the mosaic you, you mentioned, mm -hmm. that is um, the fairing uh, hypothesis. So, um, I mean, I don't know whether we distinguish which type of mosaic, so which type of patch were close to the other, whether it matter or not. But I think in the context of uh, complementarity and supplementarity theories, this might be important, no? Whether you... I mean, you, you can have like a mosaic of different habitats, yeah, but yeah. most of them maybe they are not very suitable. So do you think this this topic could be important to, to understand? I think this will help us understand more the effect of habitat amount through going more to habitat quality. But I think like the concept between amount of habitat still works when we have like this more general consideration of the green spaces. And of course, like if you have more because we are contrasting the idea that we have more, less, or gray or green, no? So at this point, if we see a signal, it actually tells us that this habitat is actually supporting biodiversity. But if we want to go more in details, then the next step would be to distinguish the different habitat categories according to their quality. But I don't think that this contracts the previous one because we were basically doing a binary distinction between um, land covers that were clearly not habitat, like roads or buildings, against land covers that can be habitat because they provide floral resources. So I think like this, what you're saying is like a second step to better understand uh, the effects or to actually target which uh, aspects of the habitat are supporting this, which is what we do then when we measure like the floral resources or we apply like different metrics or, or so. Thanks a lot for the very interesting Thanks. and uh, covering a lot, <laughs> how your presentation covered a lot. Uh, I had a question about your results uh, on the luxury effect mm -hmm. and how you mentioned that in Zurich, like there was a decrease in biodiversity with an increase of rent. And I mean, usually it's rather the opposite that's seen or at least the decrease in greenness uh, with the increase of rent. How would you explain it? I mean, actually, think about Zurich. So, I mean, like the luxury effect is true that, I mean, it's one of the first ones that was detected and it applies to several cities, but it's far from universal. It's something that has been seen a lot because it's not only the, the income, but this intersect with other social and, and economic and cultural variables. For instance, in the US, the luxury effect is explains a bit, but the racial composition or like ethnic composition explains much more than the luxury effect because there is a history of structural racism. So you wouldn't detect it only with the luxury effects. In the case of Zurich, it's a bit like a, an exception of cities, but it's 
also going on the direction of other cities is like many new areas that are developed are not that much green. So if we think in the city of Zurich and we know like think in poor neighborhoods where we have the Kenosian shafts, there's a landscape of green with a lot of big buildings, no? Because it's, well, that was the philosophy of urban planners between the 1920s to the 19, I don't know, 80s. But nowadays people like big towers, very dense, and everything like in Europa Le or Harbrücke. Harbrücke is one of the most expensive areas of the city. It's not very green at all. The other very expensive area of the city of Zurich is the near the, of the old town, which usually by definition are also not very green. So there is not necessarily always a universal, uh, well, the, the luxury effect is not, not a universal law and it also has a lot to do with the planning visions, needs of the city, like in this case, densification and also preferences like architectural preferences and so, which also explain a bit what is happening in Zurich. In other cities you see, like in Barcelona is more clear, the luxury effect, but it's true that new areas that are built with these big towers also tend to have less, less green areas in general, which is like also how architects built a bit in, in several cases. Thank you. And if I can continue, how would you continue with that in regards to like densification? in this course. And so actually, this is a bit like what I'm going to do with my next uh, postdoc mobility in Munich. So the idea is to see the mismatch between biodiversity and, and also not only in, in ecological terms, but checking what how it relates with social, economic, and cultural factors, also for instance, residential segregation and so. And it would be nice to, if we can actually model the influence of uh, scenarios, like for instance, uh, densification and so. I don't know if climate change is gonna be like a reality, it depends if the cities have models for that, but at least on densification or on greening strategies. So this is, it's, it's important and actually tells us also some information regarding, well, equity, access to green, perhaps, tangentially environmental justice and, and so. So it's definitely a feel, and I think spatial models are a way of, of addressing that. Thanks a lot, yeah. really interesting. Thanks a lot, that was a super cool recap of your last six years here. Um, here in the map, on my right, so on your left, you can see that the city center is in deep blue, right? Mm -hmm. But to be fair, this is highly correlated with the amount of green spaces. Mm -hmm. Yet, we know that diversity is not only in green spaces. Uh, yeah. There is a lot of species that actually occur in gray areas, including in our homes, right? There is this recent paper showing that there are 70 families in the American home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not species, I mean families of arthropods. So actually, if we were to take into account those gray species, how would you expect diversity to be distributed in the city of Zurich? That's a very cool question. And this actually no, don't have the data to test that. Yeah, we have the bias that the species that we collected are the species that we found outdoors. So we don't have like the home species and so. But we could see also some compensation effects in some areas. I would say though, that in very uh, like city center and so you, we still see a filtering effect probably because like dispersal and so we expect it to be more restricted as well as uh, other stress and, and disturbance as well. But definitely it could change a bit like the, the landscape in, in some areas of the city and also in the periphery. So in the periphery, we could expect like a large um, complementarity between what you have outside and what you have inside house. But yeah, I think like for this, is, it's worth doing a specific uh, sampling <laughs> of indoor biodiversity, definitely. And also to see like the share between indoor and, and, and outdoor, definitely. But so you don't expect a filtering of gray cities in green areas? Oh, the gray biodiversity, you mean? Yeah, I mean, like, if you think of, I don't know, a cockroach, harvest men or whatnot. Like... De definitely, you don't expect them to, to be occurring in that much in, in the green areas because they're actually associated with, uh, yeah, with our uh, yeah. structures, basically, yeah. But do you know that there is, like, some species that might be living in both uh, types of habitats? So not only, like, because it's not only about cockroaches or rats and so, but we also have some spiders or some other animals that not living inside houses, but maybe might be nesting in structures like birds and so, so there could be also like a, a, an effect with that, that then it's not one against the other, I would say. But yeah, I don't think we have the data to, <laughs> to test that. There is 
a long history of studies with some, I think, epistemological uh, bias, taking, you know, uh, studying urbanization along gradient from rural to to cities and showing the cities are are bad or are you know the, the interactions reduce or the species richness reduce. Do you think this type of studies comparing natural and uh, cities just to understand how cities transform um, or how different it is, uh, is still valid, um, a valid methods to, to understand cities or should we, I mean, when you study forests, you don't go outside in the, in the meadows and, and, and see how, how different it is. You, you study different forests, you different uh, structures. Do you think that this, can, can we still learn about uh, how I think like cities is, works by comparing natural systems? Yeah, I think like this is an ongoing question that doesn't have a clear answer. I think it depends on the scope of the question. If we use like focus on these studies inside cities, then we can answer a lot of questions. We can see what happens inside the city, but sometimes considering ecological gradients in a continuous way, like also going from the city to the countryside or to the other ecosystems, is also interesting because we know that it's not black and white that we change abruptly. We have that we see that the abiotic, biotic social variables are actually changing continuously. And sometimes this approach can also tell us or better understand like what is the contribution of these different predictors in shaping, for instance, biodiversity responses and so. What I would not find maybe that useful is all the time comparing like cities and, and countryside because we know like they are essentially two different land uses which serve different purposes and we need both of them. So, but actually to study how the predictors change, having like gradients that are outside cities, I don't think it's that uh, a bad idea, but also like answers other different types of, of questions. And so like, when we study elevation um, gradients and so, go through a lot of ecosystem types. Uh, and this is because you, yeah, you're interested in quantifying the, the effect of different predictors along these changes. You don't only focus on forests against meadow, you basically might do like a transit all over. So I think like with land use changes that can also can be a, a valuable approach. Any other question before closing? Chloe? So I have an announcement. <laughs> So don't forget the 6th of uh, December at uh, 3.30, there is the Biodiversity Symposium, title Biodiversity and Netto Zero. And that will be followed by uh, um, Napero and Raffel. What is Raffel? I don't know, okay. So, and there is a way to register. So you have to register in the, in the web, in the internet. Okay. So thanks for John for this yeah, nice talk and uh...